because it allows me to, 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 to clarify one thing, <laughs> namely that the critique of any other ontology here, uh, precisely because it's not in the name of an alternative ontology, is all the more imminent as a critique. That is why like, when I critique Bergson or Heidegger here, for example, I'm doing it on the level that they themselves play. I'm not saying like, oh, you can't have an intuition of duration Bergson, or like, oh, it's ridiculous to talk about the authentic Heidegger. I'm saying like, no. Let's look at what you're saying about proper temporality, and I'm going to show you how within that account there is disappropriation. Or show me duration, and I'm going to show you that you can't think it without thinking the trace. So this is again like uh, the logical here like doesn't get me out of anything. It just gets me in deeper and like places greater the balance of what I have to do because I can't avail myself of the authority of an alternative ontology to debunk you. I have to go into your house and like blow it up there. Well, what I'm saying is that an alternative ontology emerges at the end. What I'm saying is even if you go deep in, isn't there an ontology sort of emerging at the end, <laughs> even by implication? Well, on my it? part. Yeah. Well, you what have to you show like? me then. You have to show me then that I can't do this without committing myself to an ontological move I can't justify. Right. But it's precisely to preempt that that I'm insisting on the logical. Yeah. Hey, since since you uh, speak of inhabiting uh, Edgar's house, um, <laughs> the question I had was yeah. um, uh, this act, the second passage, and in particular the way in which the question of temporalization yeah. is sort of mediated by or sort of framed by a kind of language which normally one would associate with a kind of ethical answer. Yeah. And so the question of, of, of temporalization is here sort of thought through, if you like, um, uh, a set of terms like decidedness, yeah. for example, um, in which it seems to me there's something at stake that sort of exceeds the point of uh, the perspective from which you seem to critique Heidegger. Which is ultimately, it seems to me, in terms of the language you use, um, the language of Hegel's philosophy of nature. That is, the subjective movement of time, which the present negates itself, and this is what constitutes the present. And so I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about that. Because, for example, destroying dispersion here is not only a question of spatial dispersion, yeah. which is this kind of language you use, of the trace of this kind of quotation of space and time, but it also has a kind of ethical, um, or what gets called ethical quotation place. Yeah. Um, sort of resonance. And I think that does a lot to what's at stake in this past. I mean, clearly it's a kind of Kierkegaardian sort of uh, echo chamber at the end of the Alvin Wig decided yes. to yeah. So what's, how does that affect your argument, given the fact that this is very, very important, and the way Heidegger frames, uh, or let's say, um, presents his discussion of temporalization, it's very important that he presents it in these terms, steadiness, constancy, decidedness, etc., rather than, let's say, in Aristotle's physics, yeah. or in Hegel's philosophy of future. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's, that's a great question. Well, the reason why I don't attack it on that level is, again, I mean, this is a more sort of standard critique of Heidegger, that, that like, oh, the shogun of authenticity, the reliance on these sort of ethical categories that, that he does. And that's a valid critique, but it's, but it's not as deep as the critique that I want to do. Because I want to show that like, even, if, even if Heidegger let go of that normative language, or even if he could read it in a way so as to understand it, not along those ethical normative lines, there would still be a structural problem about the opposition between proper and improper. So this is to say, like, I think that the critique of Heidegger's notion of the eigentlich, you know, I mean, as I said, I think that all of the other problems also follow from this opposition, but those problems are much more well rehearsed and often not deep enough, I think, in the way they understand Heidegger. So I don't want to start there. I don't want to, like, do the cheap move of saying like, oh, sort of the authentic resolve of being towards death and the paces of that and, and undermine it in that way. I want to start like on the basic, what consequences does it have for his understanding of the concept of time? How does the opposition between the proper and the improper right. close the passageway to the thinking of the trace? And, and, then, and then, you, then you establish the trace on the basic level of Heidegger's own discourse. And on, the, and on the basis of that, you go on and make all the other criticisms. The route I'm taking, what it prepares the way for, is showing how all of these other types of oppositions between animality and humanity, or you know, appropriation, disappropriation, and so on. If you want to undercut that on the deepest level, which is how Derrida tries to distinguish himself from Heidegger, you have to first show that on the deepest level of Heidegger's account of temporality and of the meaning of being. Uh, and so, so in that way, like. Um, I am fully aware of the resonance of all those terms and the incredible importance they have for the architectonic of being in time, and I think they can and should be criticized. But I don't think 
it's for the types of different third level semantics we've got to Heidegger, you, would, you first have to show it on this level. Um, so it's a level that doesn't exclude but precedes the critique of so I, 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 I my, Just to call the follow-up comment, that would be precisely that I don't see, I think the specificity of Heidegger's account of time is precisely the fact that um, the account of typalization requires a kind of, again, ethical is not the right term for reasons we all know, yeah. but requires this language. And, and I think that um, what you're doing, it strikes me, and this happens in the book, I think, but yeah. too, is you sort of strip away all that as a kind of uh, super structural clutter yeah. and sort of reduce, if that's the, the proper term, either to a finger of time. And I don't, I mean, I say a, a philosophy of time. Yeah. I don't think that's what he's doing. Like, um, okay, so great, great. So, can I just answer quickly to that? Namely, that since my concern is, um, what is radical and important in Heidegger is the attempt to rethink the meaning being interpreted in terms of temporality. Uh, and then, like, so, so even when we, and I can grant also the other criticism of the derivative levels, but I want to also show why, like, the ways in which, exact sense in which it is radical and the exact juncture at which it fails to be radical enough. And that is that juncture. So, uh, so that would be like to think ecstatic temporality as a general condition would be to think a general impropriety, a general impossibility of being itself. Now, and Heidegger loses that when he then goes on to say there's a proper way to relate to impropriety and there's an improper way. Uh, then he loses it, the, the, the rigorous thinking of a general impossibility of being itself. And that's what I want to pursue. Uh, so, um, and that's not to say that that's all Heidegger's about this one, but I think it's, it's the most important thing he does in the history of philosophy is to say we have to rethink the meaning of being in terms of temporality. And I don't think that, that's the right question. You know, the, the, the interesting question is just like, how do you answer that question in the best way? And in which ways did Heidegger not answer it in a way that is satisfactory? I want to, uh, I think Jason's question brought something out for me. Uh, maybe I can return to it. In a different register. Yeah. I mean, even if we agree that what's radical and important in Heidegger in the history of philosophy is this thinking of time yeah. and ecstatical temporalization, you know, part of what I take Jason to be saying is that you know, Heidegger, when Heidegger thinks time, you know, you can think about actually his importance in the history of philosophy methodologically. Yeah. So he, what, what does he do? You know, he does existential phenomenology. He invents the philosophical method thinking temporalization. And that's why, you know, as Jason points out, I think, all of these, the structure of care, the structure of mood, the structure of world, all of these things, which are not any sort of appeal to naive experience or phenomenal immediacy, nevertheless have a kind of existential and phenomenal import, phenomenological import, which is not reducible to the logical structure. And now Heidegger doesn't write syllogisms on the constitution of time, that is to say. He does existential phenomenology. And so I, to just repose the question, yeah, register, I mean, because you do, you know, uh, forget about there you go, but actually, yeah, just to be clean about it, let's just pose the question about Heidegger. Like, yeah. can you really do that with thinking of time? Even if we know that being in time moves down these levels and the essence of this is, you know, this, and we get down to statical temporalization, that doesn't, it doesn't mean it's a, a logical argument. So I just wonder if actually like the way that the book is written and the way that the arguments are made precludes you know, the way in which you just want to claim that the core of it all is a logical structure that you can deconstruct or whether actually you would have to go through. I, and I, so to then grant what I expect might be a response, I know also that you want to show that the trace structure of time will be the fundamental condition for all of these modalities of phenomenal and existential experience that Heidegger is discussing. But nevertheless, it's a question of like uh, um, the conduct of the argument in that text yes. and the way in which you can't just isolate time the way that you have. Yeah. As a, you're hypostasizing, that is to say, a logical dimension of the argument. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. That, uh, that's a good question. I mean, the methodological part in terms of like, a lo the larger reading of the intent of what I do here, the methodological part is very important, and I actually want to push as far as possible the possibility of re reading the distinction between the proper and improper in Heidegger as a methodological 
distinction. I mean, because on one level, it is that, that, that is that like, so given, if it, is, if it is the case that we are ecstatically temporal, but nevertheless, it's been handed down to us that like being a substantial present, you know? And it's like, he has to give an account of how you can arrive at the philosophical insight he's presenting in being in time, yeah. about ecstatic temporality. And you can read the distinction between the proper and the proper in this methodological way up to a point. Uh, and in that case, proper, proper temporality just means, um, uh, uh, just in the proper understanding of temporality. Right. Yeah, and, I, and, and, and as far as possible, I want to try and tidy that way out, you know, that this methodological reading. But then, that, then it comes to inflect in all sorts of other things. I mean, the, the, the ethical version, instead of the proper and proper distinction, then comes to have these consequences for the thinking of time itself. It allows him to not have to answer the question of synthesis. How does he break away from the question? Precisely by appealing to not a methodological distinction, proper and improper, but appealing to that that's just when you're not resolute enough, you think you disperse and you have to synthesize yourself, but there is a modality, a proper way of comporting yourself, where you're held together in such a way that the synthesis is not an issue. So there, the very ethical, normative part of his argument allows him to circumvent one of the crucial philosophical problems that is raised by the book itself. Uh, so in terms of the more deep engagement of it's always, um, I want to be very attentive and be as generous as possible to the methodological being. And I understand that if you want to give it sort of account that he wants to do, you need a methodological distinction between the proper and the improper. But he doesn't he doesn't heed that distinction. And this example is one of where precisely the ethical normative part like has effects for the philosophical account because it allows him not to have to ask the question of how Dasan can sustain self given that it's temporal, because he said that the very question is inadequate, it's only arises from, from, from the perspective of an irresolute, inauthentic existence that can't hold itself together. So. I think uh, one or two more questions if people have them. Yeah. Just a brief question, since we'll have a chance to talk about this at the round table, but uh, for you, is it at least a thinkable possibility, even if it doesn't seem imaginable, that there could be developments in post-Darwinian evolutionary theory, uh, for example, that would force a revision of the metatheoretical, logical, expressivist framework that you are claiming to develop uh, at a second level that rests upon and doesn't legislate in a top-down fashion in relation to, that rests upon this more a posteriori empirical dimension of life scientific uh, uh, theory and practice. Yeah. yeah, that's the beauty of it being a logical and non-ontological account. And I don't have to commit myself to sort of the, the ontological all-encompassing relevance of what I'm saying. I'm just saying, but you have to show me the money. You know, I mean, you have to bring it to me. And uh, so, uh, but that's precisely one reason why it's not, why it's not ontological. And what is it, so that allows me to like not get bogged down in in, uh, in sidetracking questions like that. Thank you. Oh, I didn't mean that your question is sidetracking. It's a great question. I just mean that it would take. It would, if if I had a commit an ontological commitment like that, I would spend a lot of time trying to justify that, only to find the ground receding beneath myself, and I was losing any time to do real philosophical work. It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't worry. I'm just don't make anything. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions for our <laughs> Okay, well we can come back to these things another time. Yeah, thanks again. Thank you.